Uh, by the way, yeah, I forgot to mention this, but um, I, I've known Chris uh, from a, an, an online site that we belong to, a chat forum, uh, with, for about 14 years now. And uh, we've chatted back and forth and all this, and, and I never met, never met uh, except online. We've, we've, we've been very close friends. And, um, I, you know, I, I emailed him and I said, you know, I got this thing going on. Would you mind? Uh, you know, what, what would you. What would you charge to come out and speak to my group like that? And he says, oh, sounds like a blast. You know, I'll come and do it for nothing. You just pay me airfare in the hotel. <laughs> so, he's airfare in the hotel. We're trying to buy him some beer, but he says, as a scouser, he's a disgrace. He doesn't drink beer. <laughs> Can you imagine that, Tyson? <laughs> he doesn't drink beer. <laughs> so... Anyway, he's here um, just because he's a good guy, and no, I'm not reading anything anymore. Um, and, and only because he, because of our friendship, and he thought this would be a lot of fun. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate having him here. But anyway, uh, how's your new business going? How's your home data stuff? Yeah, it's a little slow right now. Yeah. Um, it's hard to beat like you know a thirty-four million dollar apartment in New York. You know. Um, or to go to Cyprus for a two-hour visit and the owner, you know, a Russian billionaire, telling you, well, you can't come over for two hours just to do an inspection. I've booked you into the Four Seasons, a suite in the Four Seasons on the beach for eight days, you know? <laughs> and that's happened before in the same place for somebody different. And it, it's just, I, I have a passion for designing. I also have a passion for producing. And you didn't mention, I still produce records. Oh, I didn't know that. But very little of what I do sees the light of day. And the reason is, I really don't, you know, um, I help people, I do to help people. Every, I still get three or four, five CDs a month from people who want me to listen to stuff. And every now and again, somebody rings me up and says, I know somebody who's real good, can you help them? So, um, I end up spending time with a girl singer for 11 or 12 years from the time she's 12 to when she got married and decided she didn't want to do it anymore. Helping people learn about themselves, take them in a studio. Of course, if a record I do gets released and makes money, I'll, you know, I'll be paid, but I don't charge for what I do. I just do it to, to sort of give back something of what's been given to me so freely over the years, you know? I mean, if I could add up the, the things that, you know, a musician tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, my guitar sounds better this way, or can we try this? You know, all these little things that go, usually in a hit record, it's a lot of little things. It's like an acoustic, so a lot of little things add up to one big thing, right, you know? And the big thing is when everybody enjoys a record, you know? So what I do now is I, you know, work with a couple of people who need help. Yeah. Most of them just go on and do other stuff, or, or my, um, I do what I do and nothing happens. Every now and again, you know, some of you will get signed and I get a chance to, you know, maybe recoup from it. But I, I don't worry about that. That's not why I do it, you know. And I make my living, pay the mortgage by designing things, which I also have a passion for. Like, I just designed a home for some friends. A guy who used to be in a group way back in Liverpool and he came and married a girl from America. I said, I'll buy you, I'll design your house for, just for a gift, you know. And uh, I enjoy doing that. Like, you know, it doesn't, doesn't cost me anything except time. Good. Excellent. So, again, anyone needs a home theater, studio built, anything like that, get a hold of me, and I can get you in touch with this guy, okay? So, um, I guess my favorite story that I've told, and you told us the other night, is about John's, the, the big speak on the, the Rickenbacker. Okay, the big speak on John's Rickenbacker. Yeah, that kind of is a great story. Um, so, John Lennon had this Rickenbacker, and he... The big speed tailpiece for the non-musicians is a thing that goes on the end that goes wah, 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 wah. And John didn't have one of those on his guitar. Oh, here's one over here. That's a Bixby right there. That's a Grace by Bixby. Okay, and it kind of made, John didn't, well, John had one, but he hated the one that he had on there. And then Chris had one on, on his guitar. And uh, John really liked the one that Chris had on his guitar. So why don't you pick it up from there? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, you can walk around and I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm not going to stand on the stage. I hate it. Okay. I'm going to walk down here and walk around and talk. 
Um, it, go, it goes back actually, when, when we started to get popular in Liverpool, I was able to afford an American guitar. You couldn't buy American guitars in England, but China was a trade embargo still from the Second World War on American goods. So you had to send away, if you wanted it bad enough, you had to send away for it. So I sent to America, I wrote Bigsby a letter, and that letter actually appears in the Bigsby coffee table book now, 50, 60 years later. In 1959, I wrote a letter to Bigsby and said, hey, I won't know about your Bigsby's. I wrote to Gibson, I wrote to Gretsch, all the guitar companies, and asked for their catalogs, you know? And I got them all. And I decided I really couldn't afford a really nice Gibson. I could afford the cheapest one and the second the cheapest one. The cheapest one looked cheap. The second one was called a uh, Gibson Les Paul Special, so I ordered one. This is 1959. In 1960, I got it. I ordered it with a, a Bigsby. The reason I wanted a Bigsby, it's a hand tremolo unit. It, as you move it, it, the strings go in and out of tune. And if you ever remember Walk, Don't Run, remember that Ventures? That's a hand tremolo unit, except that was on a, a Fender guitar. So, the, you know, I wanted one of those. I also saw Eddie Cochran play live in Liverpool. And um, he had one, so I just had to have one, you know? And when I had enough money to get one, I said, to wait for one. So my guitar arrived, and it was a beautiful cherry red Les Paul Special with a Bigsby on it. It didn't have a tailpiece on it, which I expected. They actually cut it off, and it's like a horseshoe. So it's known as a horseshoe thing now, and they screwed it right to the deck of a solid body guitar. So John saw it, he said, oh, well, I could, a lot of times tonight, I'm gonna have to abridge what John said because of the language, okay? You know, um, we talk, I talked it over with Jim and I'm, I'm not going to swear, okay? Or well, John would have done that, okay? Anyway, he said, wow, sort of a wow, like, you know, he said, I really want one of these. He said, this, see, he, on his um, Rickenbacker, he had a German tremolo unit, which was totally useless. It was a piece of bent metal, and that's all it was, you know, it didn't work. He put the guitar out of tune and everything. So he said he wanted one. So he ordered one. And by that time, they were available in England. This is what Bigsby had told me if I waited. He was, they were negotiating to import them to Selmer, Henry Selmer in London, who was a, you know, a big company. So John was able to get his in a few months. He just loved the one I had in my guitar. So one afternoon, after being in the, uh, the cabin, the lunchtime session, I'm across the street in a, in a pub called The Grapes. Like I said, I don't drink a lot, but I, you know, I have one beer, you know? So I was over there with all the guys and everything like that, and John comes in and says, hey, we big bees in, let's go, let's go get it, you know? He said, I've got my bloody guitar in, uh, down, the, down the cabin. So he got his guitar, and we walked down to, to a Hesse's music store. He paid for it, and uh, I said, okay. Um, I asked Jim Greffy, the guy that we all knew that worked there, have you got a screwdriver? He said, what are you going to do, put the bloody thing on here? And I said, yeah. So I said to John, you, you hold it, I'll screw it, you know? <laughs> and, that, and basically I put the thing on the guitar, you know? And the rest became history. Um, Rick and Baca have got that story in their coffee table book too. And it was just so insignificant, it took 15 minutes. But little things like this make history and everything like that. Um, I first met John in Liverpool College of Art. And um, he was in a group, and they, they weren't called the Beatles at the time, and uh, the Moon Dogs, and they were sort of uh, on the edge of Skiffle, you know, which was Lonnie Donegan. You ever hear of Lonnie Donegan, English guy? Like, you know, he did sort of uh, Pete Seeger type music, but we called it Skiffle. So we were all Skiffle groups when we started, like even the Beatles, like you know, the original Beatles. So when I met John. He was sort of um, in his uh, wannabe a teddy boy phase, you know. The ruffians in Liverpool used to dress in long coats, uh, modelled on Edwardian jackets with velvet collars. They used to carry lengths of bicycle chain underneath the lapel so they hit people with. You know, and they were, they were really rough. So John was a sort of a, a wannabe teddy boy back then. It was before his peace movement thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, when I met him, he was in art school. So art school, people in art school are a little more civilized than Teddy boys, but he was still a little ruffian, you know. But we hit it off and we just, you know, hang out together. And because we were groups, we see each other a lot. My whole relationship with John, is, you know, has always been when we saw each other. 
you know, I mean, when you're in the music business and he's playing who knows where and I'm playing who knows where and we suddenly cross somewhere, we pick up where we left off. Many of the stories I can tell you tonight just happen as I go into them, you know? We, when he was, when Yoko sent him to L.A. to get rid of him, right, you know, um, well, that's why she didn't like me, because he wasn't supposed to enjoy himself, you know? Well, of course he did, like, you know? And May Pang, his girlfriend, used to call me up and say, hey, Chris, uh, John's coming in tonight. He'd say, come over at 9 o'clock, around 9. He'll be, you know, he's coming in tonight. And that's the sort of thing, you know, I'd go over there and just hang out. And um, so one story about that, this is from... This is about four months before he was murdered. I was working in a studio called Cherokee in Hollywood. And I was working with one of the guys from War on a solo album. Um, one, uh, the keyboard player, Lonnie Jordan, on his solo, one of his solo albums. In the next studio to me, Ringo was doing an album. I go in and say I had a Ringo and things like that. But any of this one particular night, we had the days. I was doing overdubs, and when you're doing overdubbing, you want the vocals to be fresh. Nighttime is a distraction. Musicians like nighttime. They like to record at night, but it's, you know, for voices and things like that, sometimes it's not the best time. Like, you know, Lonnie is professionally enough, he liked the daytimes and have his nights free. So we booked the daytimes. So I had to be at the studio by 6 o'clock, so I'd finish about 5. Then my assistants would take note down and make all the notes off the console so we could get back to start where we were. You know, back then there was no automation. But, you know, well, like we have now, we can't push a button even on this unit back here. Just push a button and it takes you back where you were. Didn't have that. But anyway, this particular day, I decided I was going to go to the bathroom, get a cup of coffee, come back and make sure my guys were all done and then get the hell out of there, you know? And uh, as I walk out of the control room, turn towards walk the lounge, Around the corner comes Yoko and John. And John goes, bloody hell, Chris, what are you doing here like, you know? And, uh, and um, he said, hey, Yoko, it's Chris, you know? And she goes, like this, like, you know? And um, so we just stopped picking up where we left off. We just rambling on, like, you know? And, you know, our relationship was like, oh, did he ever do this or what happened there, you know, sort of thing. And I said, look, I gotta go because my guys have gotta get out of here, like, you know? And bear in mind, this is the last time I ever saw him, like, you know, and I said, I've got to go because my, i got to get my guys out of here because they have a maintenance guy comes in and he realigns all the machines for the evening sessions, you know. So um, he said, oh, okay. And then he said a very strange thing. <coughs> I was telling Jim and his brother about this last time. He said something strange that didn't, 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 he said, I suppose you want to get together then. He didn't have to say that. I mean, you know, our relationship wasn't like that. And I, I, you know, I didn't have an answer, and I said, well, look, I'll, I'll, you know, i got to go. And I was thinking about this, like, you know, and I thought about it for a couple of years, but actually at the time, about 20 minutes later, I, uh, my guys were done enough that I could leave. I had to get them ready, I have to make copies of everything, I just have to make sure everything's going to be right so I can leave. I got in my car, and I was, this is Hollywood, and, um, so, and there's an area called, um, well, well, this is, uh, what's it called now? Um, I think it's the, the, um, the Fairfax area, you know, and lots of tourists and things like that. So I go down the alley from the studio, I make a left turn, and I'm going to come back past the studio to Hollywood Hills where I lived. And I turn into the traffic, come around for the stop sign, I'm waiting for the traffic, there's hundreds of people around. And I, I'm looking, and I see John and Yoko standing, right, waiting for the light to change, like I'm waiting for the light to change. And I'm sitting in my car, and I'm going to open the window and shout to him, hey, I'll give you a call. Because I still hadn't processed, why did he say that? He didn't have to say, I suppose, you know. And um, I didn't do it. And the reason I didn't do it was, if I'd have done it, it would have ruined the moment. Everyone would have known he was there, and they were just standing there, and nobody was recognizing them. So I didn't do it for that simple reason. I figured I'd catch up on him later, like, you know? So I wrote home, like, you know? Later on, and it was maybe a couple of years later, I thought, well, I think he said that, so the onus was on me to get together, and, you know, and Yoko wouldn't say anything, like, you know? Right, you know, because, Yoko, you know, Yoko did not want him to have all the fun he was having, like, you know? 
And, and she didn't like me for that reason, like, you know. Um, almost didn't want to know me, sort of thing, like, you know. Not that I saw her that much, like, he called her mother, like, you know. You know, how's, how's mother doing, I'd say, like, you know. He said, oh, she's fine, like, you know. You know. Um, and that's the sort of way I knew John, like, you know, four months later he was dead. You know, and it was it's just a weird, weird situation, like, you know. Um, I'll take you back now to this very time when this, like, like Jim said, I never saw the show. But Liverpool was a very, very incredible place back then. There were over 350 groups playing every weekend in Liverpool. 350. In truth, there were about 12 or 14 really good bands that got to play all the big gigs in the city centre. You know, um, the main clubs and the, the child ballroom in New Brighton, the big places. Then there were about maybe 20 or 30 groups that were sort of second tier groups. Then there were a few hundred that played all the pubs and the church halls and the recreation centres. Now, we played all them too. I mean, I, I, I got memories of playing St. Luke's Hall, which is a church hall out in Liverpool with the Beatles. And John and George borrowed my Fox amplifier. We always had great amplifiers and things, great equipment. We spent our money on equipment. And John and George were plugged in my amplifier. But I had to walk on after the third song and drag it off because we were getting off to another gig, like, you know, I had to leave them to fend for themselves with the little hands they had, like, you know. And it's hard to imagine walking on the stage when the Beatles were playing and pulling your hand for fire off. But it, back then, that's the way it was, you know. Even after Epstein tried to clean them up, like, you know, they never lost that rawness, you know. I remember when um, they first went to Germany in 1960, and they played, like, the Kaiser Keller, a place called the Kaiser Keller. And um, I bumped into to John uh, the day after he came back, and I said, how was it? He said, it's bloody incredible, he said, like, he said, they, you know, they roll up the pavement up. The pavement in England, by the way, is a sidewalk, okay? And the sidewalk here, well, the sidewalk, uh, 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 the pavement is not the, the street like it's called here. They roll the pavement, John said, he, pretty incredible. They rolled the pavements up here like 11.30 in, in, in Germany. They're just rolling a bloody thing out like, you know? <laughs> you know? And it, the way the Beatles played, there was something about them. For men, you know, it's almost like they had an arrogance about them on stage, like they knew something we didn't know. They had new songs. They had a new life about them. They truly had done something that we hadn't done. They'd gone abroad, like, you know? And even to play 20 miles from home then, you know, you took sandwiches, you know what I mean? You know, and, and, you know, an idea, I mean, it was real, real strange, like, I mean, just to play that far away. But also, like, there's a place called St. Helens, which is just 12 miles from Liverpool, and the accent is totally different.